Hi, it's Dr. Z. In this video, I will review t-tests. By the end of this video, you will be able to explain the difference between z-tests and t-tests. You will also be able to conduct a two-tailed t-test for a single sample. Please print the corresponding handout for this video and feel free to pause the video at any time to take notes on the handout. Now that you have a foundation in hypothesis testing and know how to conduct a z-test, we're going to expand your knowledge and learn about additional statistical tests. In a z-test, the researchers knew the population mean, mu, and population variance, sigma squared, so that we could conduct the hypothesis test. Well, what happens if the research does not know population variance, or sigma squared? A t-test will allow us to still conduct a hypothesis test. This video will explain how researchers can do that. There are many different types of hypothesis tests. So far, you have learned about the z-test. The z-test allows us to test a hypothesis about a population on a specific sample. We calculated a z-score for the sample mean. In order to calculate that z-score, we knew population variance, sigma squared, and therefore we also know population standard deviation, sigma. Here is the formula for you to refresh your memory. Now, what if, for some unknown reason, the researcher does not know sigma? By looking at the formula, we could not use the z-test to conduct the hypothesis test. Therefore, Researchers developed the t-test for when we do not know population variance, sigma squared. We can determine the definition of a t-test by explaining it into its two parts. First, the word test is referring to a hypothesis test. So we will be using the four-step procedure that we have already learned. The t refers to the fact that we do not know population variance. And there's your definition when we put it all together. There will be three different types of t-tests that you will learn this semester. The first t-test is called the t-test for a single sample. We can figure out what this test is by simply breaking down into its parts. Remember that the t is referring to not knowing population variance. Second, the word test referring to a hypothesis test. And third, the test will compare a single sample to a population. And that, my friends, is the definition of a t-test for a single sample. This test is also referred to as a one-sample t-test. In other words, we have one sample that we're comparing to a population. With that brief introduction to t-tests, Let's get started. You've seen this diagram multiple times before. This diagram illustrates the process of hypothesis testing. We will use the same four steps in conducting a t-test with some modifications along the way. Step one, the yellow Lego, is to state hypotheses. Guess what? This step stays the same. This is also a friendly reminder to make sure to know whether you need to conduct a one-tailed or two-tailed test. The hypotheses should reflect what type of test you are conducting. Step two, the blue Lego, is to set the criteria to make a decision for whether the study worked or not. This step has modifications because we are no longer calculating a z-score. First, we will still set our significance level p, as we did for previous hypothesis tests. Second, we will have our first modification. We need to calculate degrees of freedom, which is referred to as df in statistical notation. We will need to use this new formula. Third, we will still need to find the critical region. However, the critical region is now a t, instead of a z. Since it is a t, we will be using a new table called the t-distribution t table. 
let's review what this table looks like. The T distribution table is organized with the column for degrees of freedom, columns for significance levels, and most importantly, separated into one-tailed and two-tailed tests. There are common mistakes that students can make while reading this table. This is an example to practice reading the table. What is the critical region T for degrees of freedom 15, 0.05 significance level, one-tailed? First, we'll go to the degrees of freedom column and find our degrees of freedom. Second, we need to find the significance level of not a two-tailed test, but a one-tailed test. And where those two numbers meet is where our significance level is, our critical region. The most common mistake is that students are so used to writing the critical region of Z equals plus or minus 1.96 that students want to write, write down that answer. However, in a t-test, the critical region will be different for each test because it is based on the sample size n. I now want to share a helpful tip for using the t-distribution table. If your degree of freedom is not in the table, please look up the next lowest degrees of freedom. It is better to err on the side of caution and have a smaller critical region for example, if you have a degrees of freedom equals 33, that's not going to be in the table. You should select a degrees of freedom equals 30 to conduct the hypothesis test instead of using a higher DF like DF equals 35. Step three, the red Lego, is to collect data and calculate sample statistics. This step is our second modification because we do not know population variance, sigma squared, and therefore we do not know population standard deviation, sigma. This step will require a modification of formulas because we will, not, we will now estimate population variance in standard error. So let's look at these ver uh, new formulas. First, we will calculate estimated population variance which is now referred to as S squared in statistical notation. This new formula is similar to the z-test formula, but now we divide by degrees of freedom instead of dividing by n. Second, we will calculate estimated standard error. This new formula is similar to the z-test formula as well, in that we square root the variance to get to standard error. Third, we will calculate the t-score for the sample mean with this new formula. Well, really this formula isn't that new. Notice that this is a modified version of the z-score formula from chapter 5, where mu m is replaced with mu and sigma is replaced with estimated standard error, or sm. Step 4, the green Lego, is making a decision about whether the study worked or not guess what? This step stays the same. In this test, we're just using a t-score instead of a z-score. Now that we have reviewed the steps of a t-test, are you ready to practice your new knowledge? I have one practice example for you to review. This is a short summary of the four steps that we described above. Please note that these steps are for a two-tailed t-test for single sample. Modifications for this test are noted in bold. Please pause the video to write down these steps on the video handout. This lecture example wants to explore whether hyperactive children sleep differently than the average child. This research question relates to me personally and that I am the proud parent of a child who is diagnosed with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So, since we do not know what effect hyperactivity will have on sleep, we will conduct a two-tailed test with non-directional hypotheses. The details of this research study are also provided in your video handout. Here, the average 10-year-old sleeps 8.5 hours a day, which is mu equals 8.5.
researchers studied a sample of N equals 16 hyperactive children who are not currently medicated and measured their sleep. This sample had a mean of 7.2 hours of sleep and a sum of squares equals 60. I encourage you to pause the video here and try to do the four steps on your own first, then resume the video to show the answers. Step 1. Since we are studying the effect of hyperactivity on sleep, the hypotheses will include these variables. Since the treatment in the study was children who are hyperactive, I shorten it to HYP. In notation, if the single sample is not different from the population, then the sample should have the same mean as the population, which is mu equals 8.5. The research hypothesis will reflect that there is a difference. And in notation, if the sample is different from the population, then the sample should not equal the same mean as the population. Step two. As the researcher, we get to decide the significance level, and the preferred one is 0.05. In a t-test, the first modification is to calculate the degrees of freedom of the sample. Using the formula n minus one, the degrees of freedom is 15. Since we do not know if hyperactivity will increase or decrease sleep, we need to draw a critical region T for both tails, above and below the mean. The corresponding T scores for a 0.05 significance level is two tails, T equals plus or minus 2.132. The box indicates the final answer that I will be looking for on problem sets and exams. Because the T table provides scores to three decimal places, you may keep the answer to three decimal places. Places. Step 3. Since we do not know population variance, sigma squared, we need to estimate both variance and standard error. First, we will calculate estimated population variance, S squared, with the new formula. Second, we will calculate estimated standard error, SM, with the new formula. Third, we will use the modified t-score formula that allows us to compare our sample mean and estimated standard error. We calculate using these values, and the t-score for the sample is t equals negative 2.60. The box indicates the final answer that I'm looking for. Step four. Now we need to compare the sample t-score that we calculate in step three to the population prediction which we determine in step two. In other words, does the t equal negative 2.60 fall in the critical region t from step two? Since the negative 2.60 is below the mean in the tail past the t of negative 2.132, the answer is yes. Then the decision is to reject the null hypothesis. The box indicates the final answer that I'll be looking for on problem sets and exams. More specifically, since the t-score for the sample was a negative 2.6, which is below the mean, it looks like sleep decreased in hyperactive children. After a hypothesis test is conducted, the researcher must report and interpret the results of the study. Wait, we're not done yet. Chapter 6 introduced how effect size plays a role in statistical significance. We now need to measure the effect size, or Cohen's D. These are the steps to calculate effect size for a t-test, which is now called estimated D because we, don't, we do not know population variance. Please pause the video to write down these steps on the video handout. Now, let's briefly calculate effect size for this t-test. First, we will calculate S. Second, we will use the estimated D formula. While the estimated D results in a negative value, we always report effect size as a positive value. The box indicates the final numerical answer. This numerical answer will, will be reported in the summary statement. Please see the chart from chapter six to determine whether the size of the effect is small, medium, or large. 
this verbal description will be used in the interpretation statement. Finally, we're almost there. Let's practice those summary and interpretation statements. There are three items that will be new to the second sentence of the summary statement. First, we're using T instead of Z. Second, we need to include degrees of freedom. And third, we need to include effect size, estimated D. I encourage you to pause the video here and try, the write, to, try to write the statements on your own first. Then resume the video to show the answers. The summary statement will consist of two sentences. The first sentence will report the mean of the sample. The second sentence will report the t-score, de the degrees of freedom in a parentheses after t, the significance level used, the decision you made, and the effect size estimated d. Now that we're calculating effect size, the interpretation statement will be at least two sentences. The first sentence will explain what happened, and the second sentence will explain the effect size. In summary, research often involves using samples where we do not know the population variance or the population standard deviation. Therefore, we will estimate these values. In other words, we learn how to conduct a t-test. Learning how to conduct a t-test for a single sample is one more major Lego building block needed to understand statistics.